Hey everyone, welcome back. So today I thought I'd go over the top five mistakes that I see people do when they're trying to record their classical guitar. But first, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already, it would really help support the channel. And just a quick channel update, I'm really hoping to go back to posting weekly videos, so keep a lookout for those. So the first mistake that I see people make is gain staging. Gain staging is one of those things you don't really think about, usually until it's too late. Usually you've actually already done your recording session, and you notice everything's like really, really too quiet, or if you're really unlucky, everything's too loud and you've clipped your entire session. You have to redo the whole thing. So as far as recording goes, gain staging is just kind of one of those main principles that you need to know. It's a little bit different with classical guitar because we generally don't have as many stages. Uh, if you're an electric guitar player and you play around with a lot of pedals and overdrives and amps and you know things in post-processing, you're probably more accustomed to this. You kind of have to manage your gain stages as you go on, like one overdrive pedal into another, that kind of a thing. With classical guitar, it's really just the microphone and the preamp, and maybe some plugins later on, but generally with classical guitar, you're not really using a lot of those. So really, it's just getting your volume right at the source. So my recommendation is that when you're recording, you have a really clear system for metering. It's one reason why I use Studio One as opposed to other DAWs, uh, among many other reasons. But one, they have a really handy function where you can just click the input and monitor all of your inputs, and the metering is very easy to read. A lot of times when you're recording, I know when I used to record in Logic, the meter was like really, really tiny and it's like negative 12, but you can't really see it and it skips like every 10 intervals and you're looking at the little green bar trying to go up. The best I can tell you is depending on your DAW and situation, which it's really hard for me to make a recommendation because I really don't know what you guys are using. But for the most part, I try to get it about three quarters of the way up. The main thing is you just don't want to clip. If you're doing digital audio, which most of you are, just don't clip. As long as you don't clip, you're fine. You also generally don't want to record too quietly, and that's kind of what I see a lot of people do, is they just don't record loud enough, where it's it's really, really quiet, or they don't put the mics close enough, and then when you get your, you know, your final recording and you try to make it louder, you then end up amplifying a lot of the signal noise and like mic noise and ambience along with the guitar. So you end up with this thing that's like half guitar signal and the other half is this kind of shh sound which really isn't great either. So some of it is gain staging, like actually setting your preamp volume, and then the other is mic placement. And that brings me to my second tip, mic placement. And these aren't in any particular order. If I had to rank them, I think mic placement might actually be the top one. But not experimenting with mic placement is probably the biggest problem that I see people do, is they either put the mics way too far away or way too close, and they don't really take the time to experiment, because really it depends on the guitar. I have a lot of people ask me how I get certain tones out of my recordings, and a lot of them just have to do with the type of guitar I play. The guitar I play is a Cedar Cedar double top, it's really loud, and it's ridiculously warm sounding. So I get a certain tone and I know where to put the mics accordingly. If I put them too close, it just sounds like a boomy mess. If I put them too far away, you know, it's really, really dull. And depending on the guitar you're using, you might not be able to exactly replicate that without you know changing up the mic placement. So if you watch some of my other videos, I give a really general idea of what sounds good on most people's instruments. But if your guitar is really, really quiet, or if it's really, really loud, you might need to move those. That's why I really hesitate giving like, put your guitar 48 inches away from this and then space the thing, you know, like concrete measurements. Because I really don't think it helps all that much. I mean, it's a general thing. Like I usually just reach my arm out and it's close and then I adjust it. But the most important thing is, is that I'm always listening to what my changes sound like. So if I move the mic, I'll do a test recording and then I'll listen to it. And then I just keep kind of doing that until I find the optimal placement. And this way, when I record, I don't have a lot of stuff to do in post because pretty much everything's already done on the way in. I then don't have to go back through and EQ. And the problem is too, is a lot of times people are like, why don't you just EQ a bunch of bass? Well, the way EQs work is that they boost certain frequencies. And if you don't have those frequencies in the first place, all you're really doing is boosting nothing and it gets really noisy and it's just kind of a mess. So if there's one thing you can really work on, it's just mic placement. And if you're unsure what a good recording sounds like, I'll go ahead and link in the description my last video on how to use reference tracks and that should really help you out. So my third mistake is one topic that I really haven't covered on this channel before and that's string choice. And primarily I mean that's kind of choosing between uh, carbon strings or nylon strings, but also new strings versus old strings. So I love to play live with carbon strings, but sometimes when I record, they're a little bit finicky. Uh, certain notes kind of are a little too piercing, primarily the high E string. If you play anything with a carbon string, it really, really sings and cuts through, but when you're recording, it can be a little peaky. 
The other problem I have with carbon strings is that, you know, they're great live because you're really trying to project and get a really powerful tone that's really bright. The problem is with carbon strings is that it's really hard to do vibrato. And if you're really trying to be expressive on a recording, you kind of want to be able to do vibrato. And those strings like have such a thin diameter and they're kind of a harder tension. You can't really get that. Uh, I also just in general find that the carbon strings that I use uh, sometimes get a little bit scratchy like fairly quickly, so to where they almost sound like rectified strings, which I hate, by the way. I know you might like those. I hate rectified strings so much, but basically I hate that scratch, that nail noise. And so that might be a consideration. And that also brings up the age of your strings. I don't really recommend using really, really old strings because one, it just sounds really dull and lifeless and you don't want to sound like you're just palm muting every single bass note you play. But you also don't really want to use brand new strings because those things are squeaky. Um, there's some recordings that I've done where I just, you know, I've changed my strings and I just want to record a piece, usually for a YouTube video or something, and I notice afterwards that the strings are just so lively that just touching the string just makes it squeak, you know, and it's, or if you have the mics too close or something like that. But usually what I like to do is put the new strings on and then try to break them in for a little bit, particularly the bass strings, because those ones are just very live, you know, very, very squeaky, even with the best technique. As soon as you put those things on and you have a really sensitive microphone, it's just gonna be kind of squeaky. And I play a double top, so the squeaks get amplified even more. So I have to be super careful. But that's kind of my recommendation is to like put them on a week ahead, kind of play through them. And if you're one of those people that really kills strings, you know, maybe a little bit less, like a day or so, but you know, kind of use your best judgment. Point being is really consider your string choice when you're trying to record. Now the fourth mistake that I see is too many edits. A lot of times when you become proficient in recording, you get really used to how to do things like crossfades and different takes. And it's really cool because you can splice different takes and kind of go for your ideal interpretation. The downside is, is that you can splice different takes and sometimes go a little too far in trying to get your ideal interpretation. A lot of times what I see people do is that they'll splice like by the bar. And when you listen to it, it sounds clean. Like I don't hear squeaks or, you know, wrong notes or anything, but it sounds like musically disjunct. It'd be like if I took what I'm saying right now and I recorded it just one word at a time it wouldn't really have the same delivery. So you can watch a lot of my other videos where I kind of show you how to prepare for a recording session. But generally what I like to do is try to record in as many complete takes as possible and then go through and just kind of splice some of the hard bits and things or, you know, just have enough material to work with. But I really don't recommend just going on a minute level and trying to just record bar by bar and then drop in everything because it just sounds kind of weird. Now my last tip is one of the most important and that's kind of what happens after you're done recording and you're checking your mix. So you've done your recording, you've done your mix, your EQ and all that stuff. And that's kind of checking your monitoring solution. So I monitor with two actual monitor speakers. They're Yamaha HS5s. I have a modest amount of acoustic treatment. It's not ideal. Uh, one reason I haven't been able to do a lot of videos is the acoustics in this room just aren't done yet. I'm ordering panels and things and trying to tune it and it's really frustrating. I miss my old studio so much. But the point being is that when you're listening, a lot of people don't even have that or they don't have really good headphones. You know, you're listening on earbuds, computer speakers, and what sounds good in your room does not sound good everywhere. And this is a lesson that's kind of learned the hard way and you won't really believe it until it happens to you. I, I guarantee you, go listen to one of your mixes in your car and see how awful it sounds. You know, if you're not used to actually balancing mixes and checking them in different environments. So a lot of times people will listen to it on like a home stereo setup with subs, or you listen to it on earbuds or computer speakers, and it just sounds great on one, awful on other, something with a sub just sounds boomy. And that's kind of a skill that you have to learn. And it's also why I recommend having good monitors if you can afford them. They're stupidly expensive, and if you're just doing this for a hobby, get some good headphones. But the problem with headphones is that you can't quite hear what the reverb sounds like. And it's it's hard to explain unless you've actually done this, but on on headphones, you can easily add a ton of reverb and not know it. Like the, the way that your ears perceive it is different. If you're listening to speakers in a room, your right ear is actually getting the left speaker and the right speaker kind of mixed together. There's phase cancellation, all kinds of crazy stuff. But if you're listening on headphones, your right ear only hears the right channel and your left ear only hears the left channel. There's no cross like there is in an actual room. So when you're listening to reverb tales, you're not really hearing that unless you hear two speakers actually play the thing and then you might go like, oh my God, I've added so much reverb or vice versa, you haven't added enough. So if there's kind of a piece of equipment that you might look to upgrade in the future, I highly recommend just getting a set of monitor speakers 
and maybe some, you know, modestly priced cheap foam. If you can afford it, I highly recommend like actual fiberglass insulation panels, which I should hope to have in the next few weeks, but we'll see. Point being is you just wanna check your mix everywhere and make sure it sounds exactly how you want it. Well, that's my time. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, comments, or topics you want me to cover in future videos like this one, please leave them in a comment down below. See you guys in the next video.